back to the idea that a speech, a clumsy speech, I'd say, or not an inelegant speech, not a Martin Luther King speech, can it still be a good speech without paying homage to the narrative or the storytelling style? In fact, I would say, I would argue that some speeches, because of legal reasons or copyright reasons or reasons of purpose of utility, have to be delivered so that people think that it's not a story, that they're giving a speech that is factually based. Ha ha. We went down the rabbit hole on this one. What is the difference between a speech and a story? It's not that easy to unpick and identify, and you will hear us over the next few minutes literally struggling with that concept. And it doesn't mean we have the answer. It just means it is not that easy. Hello. My name is Michael De Groot. And hello, my name is Michael Don Smith. And together, we're bringing you the story of a speech. And what a story it is, a has been. We're hopefully, not hopefully, we are getting better each podcast. And we're going to try, and not try, we're going to make them regular every two weeks from now until the end of time. And that'll be a good story. <laughs> so two sessions ago, we talked about the definition, the meaning of what is a speech, and we decided it was a, uh, a message that was timed that carried information vocally, and it was, back in the day, it was a very treasured skill, maybe tailed, tailed off a little bit in the present. And, and then last session, Michael, you talked about what a story was. Have you got a two-second, two-minute praise of that? Oh, I'll have a go. Um, we talked a little bit about the four stages of a story, like the setup, the challenge, the, the impact, and then the resolution. And we talked about you know, having characters in those stories and people going on a journey, discovering themselves, go, you know, an adventure and then um, having some challenges on that adventure and then coming back and coming back as the hero, the hero's journey. We probably also talked about very briefly. So let, let me just recap again. I said a story. Speech is a message that conveys some information and it was very popular. And basically, a speech is a way of conveying information for various purposes. And then I stopped. You told us what the contents of a story was. And all the, cause you're a storyteller. You can't, you can't do bang, A, B, C, over. So what, I'll ask you again, <laughs> what is a story? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You could say in one sentence. One sentence. An account of an imaginary or real people and events told for entertainment. Great, great. Or oh, so yeah, this is the struggle we have as we dance around in the minefield of language. And the reason we had those two sessions, because I asked Michael, so what's the difference between a speech and a story? Clearly, we understand that there are elements that are similar in both things. But if one's called a story and one's called a speech, they must be different. So that's why we thought before we get into that, let's do two, two sessions about what's a story must be. So please go on to the uh, podcast list and pop back there and read what we think about that. And you understand some of the background to where we continue. So, Michael, where, where would we use a story and perhaps where would you, we use a speech? That might be a, a jumping off point. Yeah, and there are many different schools of thought around this, of course. And the, the one example 
that I always like to go towards, and you have first-hand experience of this, is TED Talks. Now, just so that everybody knows what TED stands for, T-E-D stands for Technology, Entertainment and Design. And this is something that started by Chris Anderson years ago. I think it must have been 2004 or something like that. Like one and a half decades ago, at least, even before we had kind of broadband, proper broadband. And they're just very, they're less than 20 minute talks that you could say is a speech, but you could also say it's a bit of storytelling because it's actually mixed up. So it is confusing, Michael. When is a speech a story and when is a story a speech? Because you can use both. And I'm practicing that with myself just before we came onto this podcast. You know, I'm learning from you, the signature speech coach, that you need to be able to know what you're saying to people and be, you know, rehearse it so that it just becomes very natural. Um, and I'm doing that, but I'm doing, I'm going to tell, you know, my kind of signature speech or short speech would be a short story because obviously that's what I focus on. Um, and in business, <laughs> then storytelling is more memorable, I believe, than just giving people facts, uh, which aren't always that memorable. And you could believe that people in speaking will just deliver facts, potentially. So I need your help and assistance to kind of unpick this a little bit, because I think that there is massive overlap between the two. Okay, well, I suppose just from what you said there, and when we brought the business element into it, Although they can both be used for the same purpose, technically, a story has to be a narrative. And a narrative means that there's a narrator, there's the, 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 uh, the action in the story, and then there's a denouement, which I don't even know what word looks. Somebody look that up, but I normally write. So the denouement, there's a, there's a there's something that happens at the end, the moral, if it's um, Aesop's fables, there's a, there's a purpose and a lesson, which is what you said there about being memorable. So a story is, in the purest sense, a way of sharing information that is definitely memorable and it's repeatable. So you have fables, you have legends, you have myths, you have stories that come down through time. So one extreme of communication, it's a a message that's actually designed to be remembered and repeated and to resonate. So three R's, I just made it up there. So it's just to be, uh, what, what, that's, what were the three R's? I've got to resonate, repeatable, and I'll have to go to the tape. So uh, that's a story. It's an, uh, put an entertainment in there. Whereas a speech can be just a relaying of Old hard facts. Yes. And then in between you have the so here's here's, here's an example. If I asked you about the story of Little Red Riding Hood, everybody who's heard that story immediately knows the context. Little Red Riding Hood, the wolf, grandma. So mm. all the pieces are there. And the point was that, you know, the wolf was a bad person, the run was going to the forest, the wolf turned to be the grandma. You can get all the pieces. But a famous speech is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream. Mm. And I challenge anybody, however much they love that speech, to know they remember I Have a Dream. They might remember about the color of a man's skin is of no one importance and the content of their character. But it's not a story. So the I Have a Dream speech is definitely not a story. Mm. Does that make sense? Well, it does, it, it does make sense. It does make sense. It is a story. 
Yeah, th it does make sense. Although what happens is when you relay, when he relayed his dream, what had to happen in people's minds, because he had no visuals, he didn't have a PowerPoint that he was presenting from, or a couple of images he was presenting when he was doing that speech. He was giving them visual cues of what the world could look like for him and his, you know, his friends or for society as a whole. And therefore, people had to picture that and see that in the head and visualize it. And as soon as you put visual, we have to, to make sense of words, we have to put visual things into our brain. And, and because that's how we store the information. So we create, um, we create the story in our brain from what we hear. So even if we hear a speech, which is just relaying facts, because we have to make sense of it, we attach it to bits in our brain that already exist and create a new, a new neural network with things we already know about the world that we live within, with time, places, events, situations, people. And so we actually do create a story of that in our brain. So I agree with you. It's just communicating, you know, complex data or information that people don't necessarily will remember. But what we try and do, we do try and remember it. We do try and remember so, it. So uh, uh, I'm going to step back a little bit there. So you, you, you covered a lot there. With neural, your talk of neural networks and stuff. So back to the idea that a speech, a clumsy speech, I say, or not an inelegant speech, not a Martin Luther King speech, can it still be a good speech without paying homage to the narrative or the storytelling style? In fact, I would say. I would argue that some speeches, because of legal reasons or copyright reasons or reasons of purpose to utility, have to be delivered so that people think that it's not a story, that they're giving a speech that is factually based. Is, yeah. that, in, is that an area where a speech stands on its own and actually shuns the story and yes. others if i'm hearing the budget report from the chancellor of the exchequer do i want a story or do i want a speech yes you want a speech <laughs> yeah it's the budget speech isn't it it's not the budget story yeah because yeah. <laughs> it, it would have a totally different i mean we're getting we're getting some clues here aren't we yeah so there's some things we want to be a speech and some things we want to be, a, even the famous wedding speech. If you said, okay, uh, the groom stands up, someone, I'm going to now give the wedding story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I believe reality exists in language. You know, when you, when you test language, it's magical. And just saying, I'm going to go and give a speech on this important life and death topic means something different to, I'm now going to tell you a story about what happened on the Titanic that fateful day. Mm. We expect a story to bend reality. Perhaps less so, we don't expect the speech to bend reality. Is that, is that a difference? It's a good question. And I was, still, I was still stuck on the budget speech there for a second. <laughs> Okay. I, I so still, what, what, what I still is, come back to, I come back to the fact that even though when we hear a speech and even though it might be transmitting data, let's say that I, I've been to some presentations before where they've shared some data that they've collected from small businesses in the city of Birmingham in terms of their business results over the past quarter 
and they do like a quarterly briefing at a at Birmingham University, Birmingham City University, and they share with us, you know, roughly whether people are optimistic about business, pessimistic about business, and they they share all of these statistics and information, which very very difficult to remember because it's not attached to anything. What we do in our brain when we hear those statistics, nevertheless, we put ourselves in into that narrative about that and go, oh, how is that happening to me? How is that affecting me? Or maybe I am affected by this, or maybe that's the same for me. If you're listening to a budget speech by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, then you're going to be thinking about, oh, uh, cigarette taxes have gone up, alcohol taxes have gone up, oh, that's going to affect me. Oh, that means I'm not going to have as much money each month. Or, you know, oh, I'm going to get a tax rebate. Oh, that's good. And so you do put yourself then, even though there are these facts being transmitted, you and your brain create a stupid story around it, whatever it might be. So your your arguments are suggesting that they that you can have you can't have a speech about a story because of our innate human propensity to make meaning because we can't not make meaning and comprehend something. So whatever it is for it to land, there has to be a neural network. There has to be something there for it to land on, to register. And you're suggesting that that is the story-making function, this ability to whatever comes in it has to fit with something else that came in before it yes we already have things in our brain experiences knowledge information on places times events people that we carry around with us so when information comes in we then create a new set of circumstances with the information we already have there. And well, therefore, we're... Well, there is, there is, there, I'm just, the reason I'm going to stop you there is I've got to make a big challenge there because there is one group of people that that can't be true of. Go on. In fact, this group of people, there's no way they can do what you just said, attach stuff that was there beforehand. Do you know who they are? Children. <laughs> babies. Not babies. even children, babies. Yeah. So what what happens? What are babies doing then? And we we're we're, well, we're in the realm of story here, but how do how do babies make sense of the world? Because they've got they've got nothing to attach it to, unless we're gonna start talking about pre history, you know, the stuff that they're born with certain things already in, apart from fear of edges and fire and loud noises. It's, well, they, okay, so if, if, and we don't know, it's a big if, and I don't know if, if neuroscience has uncovered this or not yet, and I don't have the knowledge on that yet, but babies, I believe, copy right so they for them to learn they have to do a certain amount of copy there are some things already they know how to do right so how to get food they already know that they know what they have to do they all they have to do is cry and they know they're going to get food when they're hungry right so that becomes then a, a conditioned response that they use over and over and over but to form neurons in their brain through learning to start creating their narrative on what's happening in the world around them, to begin with, they've, they've got to start copying what other people are doing. It's the only way they can learn. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And in fact, neuroscience has identified a neuron which is called the mirror neuron mm. 
and babies have more mirror neurons than anything else. So, they, so what a mirror neuron does, it identifies the, uh, most animals, species, mammalian species have this. So it mirrors, it copies without any cognitive bias or consideration, which is why if you had a child, a baby, and you expose them to, to seven languages, they would learn all seven because they would literally have so many mirror neurons that can mirror everything. And that is the nuances, the cadence from Chinese to Inuit. So this is what's happening. So my proposal is that speech comes before story. Because as you said, the baby, I'm just making this up for listeners. You know, there's this just um, as I'm, I'm storytelling. <laughs> and in my story, the speech comes before the story. So when the baby cries, that's not a story. It's a fact. I am hungry. And so initially, the cry is a speech. But as the density of mirror neurons allow new neural connections that create other kinds of neural pathways and creativity, so as well as hearing the language, just stick with language. So the language is mama, dada. So they start copying. But then when they've got so many words, they can start connecting those words together in novel ways. And based on the response they get from their environment, they can manipulate their language to create meaning. So suddenly the cry actually means, not that I'm hungry, I'm just fed up with that toy and I want a different toy. Or so what do you think about that concept? Speech comes first because it's just mimicking, no, sorry, because it's fact. It's information concerning the state of the baby that needs to stand out there for survival. But storytelling is when you're deliberately trying to convey a specific meaning. And this then allows stories to tell lies. <laughs> I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to accept it, only from the point of view we'll just be going round in circles. Um, <laughs> You know, when, when there was, a, well, the baby hasn't got speech yet. So you could say, when, when I say speak, they can't speak yet. So all you get are crying noises, grunting noises, different noises. That's speech in my world. That's, that's speech. Okay, that's speech. Fine. Let's stay with that. Let's have, let's have, let's have a fight. Well, don't, don't, let's, let's have a fight over it or a, a, yeah. a, a discussion, a dialogue, a debate. But no, it I, is I, a grunt speech. Yeah, it's it's mm, yeah, okay. It is, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, of course it is. And it's also it's also what once they so the 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 grunt or the cry creates a story in the recipient's brain because Ooh. because Ooh. the mother or the father goes ah that must mean this. That could be true or Wait, not. Sorry to, sorry to, but that then underlines what you're saying about when people are listening to a grown-up speech from the chancellor, they hear it and they translate it mm. into yes. whether they want ciggies or beer or kale yes. crisps yes. or the price of... So, yeah, that, that's that. That, the metaphor is quite consistent there, isn't it? Yes. Totally. So we we are... I didn't want to throw it. I always say we are the biggest storyteller in our lives. We don't need to hear a story to be a storyteller because we tell our own stories <laughs> about because of what's happening around us. Yeah. So story, so okay then. So the storyteller, the good storyteller, is one who connects their new meaning or novel meaning to what people already know with little twists and nuances. The bad storyteller is somebody who tries to force a, a completely new narrative onto the audience. 
Would you would you agree? Hundred percent. Your thoughts on that? Hundred percent, because the the there is a framework which says that you need to have some novelty in the story, fine, but people want to be able to relate to it. So if they can't relate, so if there isn't already something there that is relatable, then it's very difficult for them to take it on board. So the, the, the relatable bit, the relatable bit is what you just said, which is there is already something there that you connect to. So is the relatable bit in politics what they call spin? So you have the fact, oh. and then you have the spin. Oh, God. So now speech writers, people who write, <laughs> people who write speeches 30 or 40 years ago, I remember maybe spin's always been around, but the speeches used to be just, the chancellor would come out and say, this is the budget. It's ten pounds for this, twenty pounds for that, and that's your lot. Go away and play with it. Hmm. They don't do that anymore, though, do they? They say what difference no. it will make to you. But yeah, you're right. I mean, oh. so forget. For, I think the budget speech is a really tough one to swallow, really because so many people are not interested um but you know the the speech by you know kennedy is a more interesting speech that people want to be or churchill is a more interesting one that people want to connect with and whereas if you said well do you remember the budget speech from last month or are you looking forward to the budget speech people are going to say no so you've already got <laughs> no, yeah, people already switch off. So it's it's a good one to let, let's say in, let's say in general because we may have some uh, diehard accountants on the call. Mm. Let's just say the majority might not like the budget speak. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that's kind of a joke. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, the yeah you. Sorry, I was trying to. Re you were saying that the Kennedy speech had more um, interest. Yeah, I mean, when I walk in Digbeth, which is an area inside Birmingham City, when I walk in a certain direction, there is a big kind of art installation which has got President Kennedy on it, with lots of people around him, and to celebrate when he came to Birmingham, whenever it was. And I wasn't, I was not old enough to remember the guy, but I remember my mother being in tears when she watched that program or the report rather, the report on him being shot. And I remember that. I remember the emotion around it because you know, the emotion was your mother is upset. So therefore, as a child, as a young, young boy, I was upset to see her upset. And so I have, I have, um, you kind of, I've got this affinity with him, but I don't really know him, <laughs> you know? So I think, and it's just my story that I've attached to it. That's made me remember the guy but I don't really know him or remember him. I just remember my own little narrative story around the incident. And that's what I mean. So even if we, and that's just factual kind of news data, and you could say news data are, are mini speeches. Oh, well, are they mini stories as well? But people are sharing <laughs> factual information. I, you can't get away from it. You can't get away from it. <laughs> Well, I, I think you can get away from it, but we are being trained and taught not to in the era of fake news and tweets and Twitters. So you are a skillful communicator if you can make your tweet effective. 
But how can you be, if you're a lawyer, if we're talking about laws, a contract, I mean, do you want a contract to be a story? Do you want the meaning of a contract to depend on what the listener hears? Isn't that surely how lawyers make money, actually? The fact that we can interpret the, they write these contracts in such a way to stop us being able to turn them into stories and keep them as fact. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you that we're going in a slightly different direction there, but I, we are contracts are contracts. They're, they're boring and they, they, they just deliver a particular purpose and that's fine. But then they're not speeches either. But, is it, but, but they are, ah, but could they be? Because what is a speech? I think we're, this is the, the, in the modern world where entertainment is the god of everything. People have to be entertained. Mm. To quote um, Maximus Decimus, whatever his name was, from The Gladiator, mm. are you not entertained? Give mm -hmm. them bread and cakes. So we're, we're kind of seduced by this entertainment away from the facts. So the, the accountant and the statistician and the, uh, the actuary, they're frowned upon in polite and social circles, but they're running the world. You know, the numbers at the end of the day run the world. You could, like, we, you know, so much is happening. And I just wonder if. The uh, ability to communicate by speech, I'm just making this up, no, no, no facts, mm. is, is losing its ground to the, the ability to make, tell stories. Because there, there should be a place for people to sit down and listen to prose, listen to facts. Can you, this is my question, I like to, I like to ask you the question. So, mm. you know, can a speech be engaging without having to be full of hyperbole and pandering to the lowest common denominator in terms of entertainment? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> yes, it can be. It can be. And that's down to if you, if it's, if you're relaying facts and information, a speech that relays facts and information for the audience to be impressed by, it then gets down to the person who's delivering it and how you deliver it. And because it can be, you know, a boring presentation or it can be a great presentation or a speech. But to engage and, and, and your audience, you have to be, you have yes. to be more, you have to be um, animated. You have to have some intonation in the way that you're speaking. Um, you have to get the audience to perhaps have some humour in there somehow um, to get the audience laughing well, and get I'm, them on I'm your side. You, I don't, I don't, I don't, no, you've gone. I think you've gone back to storytelling again. It's well, so seductive because you can do that, but why should you? I mean, I, I would. I'm just being. <laughs> I'm standing on the side of the speech. May, I, I'll, I'll go with big graphics, you know, have some pie charts in there, maybe mm, mm. have some uh, pictures. But I don't think, of course, I know humor is good. If, somebody, if somebody's sitting down for a 10, sorry, a three hour presentation, without humor there, you're going to kill them. So, yes, it needs humor to, to lighten it and level it. So, the humor then. So you're right, it does need humor, but yeah, so I'll take that back if it's of length. But I think we've got to be careful that the the person with the person with the ability to answer the questions factually and to deliver the information, you know, the, the professor, the, the the egghead, it seems they're not allowed to speak anymore because you need to have a a, a face that is a presenter who perhaps has less intimate knowledge of the subject matter, but is more acceptable to the audience. Is that where we are now? You can't, 
be put in front of the people unless you're an, an entertainer. Yeah, that's a really valid challenge. And not everybody is an entertainer, definitely. And unless you've had some training to be able to do that. And therefore, you then get into the realms of, well, if you're delivering a speech and you're relaying factual information, how are you going to make it engaging? You know, surely you as a signature speech coach will help people to make their speech um, memorable in some way. If that's appropriate, and this is what I'm saying, because some speeches, some of my clients, the people coming to hear them speak are paying for their knowledge. Mm. So it's so it's they're they're gonna put matchsticks under their eyelids, they're gonna drink coffee, do whatever they have to do to stay awake. So yeah. the challenge is 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 more on the memorable side than the interesting side. Mm. And just remembering what this is, the difference between a speech and a story, which I'm starting to learn now. So this, this, I'll have to listen to this podcast myself. But mm -hmm. um, the speech, I think the emphasis is on information being transmitted where the detailed information is crucial. And this is, this, this is a, a um, continuum. It's not black and white. It's shades of gray. And at the other end of the story, it seems that the data is less important. But as you said, the humor, the emotion. So you want to, to capture the feeling in your audience so that you take them to a place. But at the same time, stories have been used for navigators. You know, um, nursery rhymes have been used so that people know where the North Star is. So, in this, and in fact, here's a point: we've forgotten the real deep meaning of a lot of nursery rhymes and fairy tales, because they were actually taught initially as mnemonics. Four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. That was twenty-four hours in a day, and it was you know it was countless of that. The thing between perhaps a speech and a story in the continuum is a speech isn't disguised or allegorical. It tends to be more factual. Yeah. Whereas a story um, leans more on metaphor and simile and allegory than it does on fact. Mm. Because it's just it's perhaps got less information and more entertainment. Yeah. Interesting. We uh, I went to a talk was it a speech was a, a talk I, I, I mean don't want to introduce another bit of language but there was a an artist he was explaining his art now he could have said oh here's a photograph of me in a forest wearing a mask of my father and he's standing next to me right but that's not what he said yeah he shared the story about his father and he was very vulnerable with it and was very honest and open about some of his father's mental health difficulties when he was a younger boy, not the father when, when the guy who was presenting, the father's son was a young boy. He can remember some of his father's difficulties and, and that's why he did some of this art around that. But he explained it. So we saw the art in a photograph that he presented in a PowerPoint presentation. And then he shared the whole story about the art to make the art come alive. Now, if you went to an art gallery and you looked at the art and you just saw the art on the wall and you looked at it, you would not have the artist's background story about that art, right? It's just, wow. factual, it's just factual information. You're just looking at the art. And it's just coming at you, just looking at it and absorbing it. But for you to make some sort of sense of that art, you will create your own story in your brain and go, okay, for me, that's what's it, 
that's what that art's telling me, right? That's what I'm taking from it. So he could have just presented his piece of art in this photograph and gone, okay, what does this mean to you? And got some information from the audience first before he explained what he was doing. So I, I, um, I don't know why I'm even saying this or sharing this in response to what, but the well, no, it, it sounds. But no, no, it, it sounds like what you're saying is that um, what I got from what you're saying is that stories. You know, the picture paints a thousand words. Mm. So you, it's a perfect illustration of what you were saying before, because you. A picture is just facts. It's just data, isn't it? Yes. So you could say that's the ultimate expression of cold data being presented. Mm. And even though the person who drew the picture had a particular set of understanding and meaning that he was trying, that he was conveying. Yes. The audience looking at it will take whatever they want from it. Yes. So. The speech, right? So, just a, another way of saying what you said before. Actually, whatever the speech is, the communication is, and actually, it's one of the things on my slides in the the training I do. The meaning of your communication is the response it gets. So that art doesn't mean anything other than what goes on in the mind of the viewer. Mm. So it looks like story is coming out on top. <laughs> I've tried my best. I've gone back to the babies. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the human mind is a meaning-making machine. Yes. It has to make sense. Even if it doesn't make sense, we will make it make sense. And the point that you're making very well in this is that we can make, we can give the best speech and we think we want the audience to take something away based on what we've written or read out or said, but there is no way we have, will ever know the meaning that they're giving to that. As long as they're payers, that's the main meaning. <laughs> 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 yeah, but you, sorry, I always do that. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I think, and I think we're coming to a kind of where we've got to. So, mm. so what? What? How would we sum up that? The the what's what? So what's the conclusion? What's the point? What's the moral of the difference between a speech and a story? Is there anything that people can use from what we said in crafting stories or crafting speeches? or communicating actually for me i would say it doesn't matter whether you're sharing a story or a speech the recipient will create a story from it or if you or if you're just sharing a picture if you're just sharing a picture on your phone yes so we as 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 michael the group wisely said we just make stories we just make stuff up Mm. all the time and apparently i don't know how they figure this out one of the statistics said 50 percent 50 percent of all our memories are not true they're just what we decided and every time you remember something you change the memory yeah if some you access a memory you you change the neural pathway mm. you know if you remember a story when you're angry you remember it a certain way if you remember a story when you're happy, you remember it another way. But the fact of remembering it recodes it or mm. adjusts it. Mm. So we don't even know what happened to us in the past because we're so good at creating stories. Yes. Yeah, 100%. 100%. It's it's a it's a wonderful thing the human mind it's so creative basically it's so creative and we have no idea how creative we we are no idea how creative we are 
Yeah. And on that, what a great note. So speech and stories, very similar. A speech is an attempt to circumvent the storytelling ability of the brain that was doomed to fail. So the story is to be human, to tell stories is to be human. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Let's end it there then. Good place to finish. Yeah, I think we've packed a lot in there. Fantastic. Well, I've been Michael Don Smith. And I've been Michael De Groot. And together we've been, we've been bringing you the story of a speech. Phenomenal. Thank you. And uh, ta-ta. Bye for now. <laughs>